I'm going to take a step back from talking about, uh, we've heard lots of great stuff about tactical uh, things we can do. I want to talk a little bit more about our practices as an industry uh, with regards to a sustainable mindset, uh, specifically looking at the concept of technical debt uh, and how we can work smarter to avoid uh, its impacts. Uh, and before I start, I just want to give a quick shout out to my colleague, Aaron, uh, who helped me with the uh, the visual uh, design elements for my presentation today. Uh, so when a programmer test says technical debt, uh, typically they're referring to things in their code base that uh, have slipped in there uh, that they never have the time or budget to, to go back and clean up, uh, which is, uh, if you've spent any time around, pro around programmers, a, a huge frustration. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, um, just a few definitions to get started. Um, I consider technical debt to be wasted performance, time, and money tomorrow as a result of decisions or choices made today. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, we're talking about decisions and choices made today that impact performance, maintainability, accessibility, or decisions and choices that we can make tomorrow. Uh, so debt as something we owe in the future, uh, debt's contrary to any sustainable system. Uh, it's contrary to a sustainable economy, it's contrary to a sustainable household budget, uh, it's contrary to uh, sustainable use of resources. And if technical debt is a, a result of decisions and choices, uh, what I want to talk about is the space in which those decisions and choices are made uh, in our industry and how we work. Um, Getting into that, uh, we had a we had a presidential election uh, in November here in the states, which I'm, I'm sure everybody is aware of. Uh, I'm not going to talk about politics, policies, or personalities, but um, there was something that was talked about after the election uh, that I found interesting and, and I, I found relevant to our industry, uh, which is that there aren't a lot of rules around how a president or a member of Congress must conduct themselves or behave or fill their role. Uh, there's what's referred to as norms and self-restraint. Um, and similarly, our, our industry, the work we do, we don't have a lot of rules and regulations in UX design and building websites. Um, but we, we, we have developed some of these norms. Um, so for example, uh, you know, your workplace might tout an appreciation for work-life balance and say that your time off is your time alone. Uh, but it, particularly here in the States, uh, we don't really enforce that. We don't uh, we don't shut down email servers after hours like uh, like they do in, in some companies or, or other countries. Uh, we don't block accounts if you're on vacation. We don't have penalties if you email your colleagues when they're on vacation. Uh, Work-life balance is a norm. It's not, not a regulation or strict policy. Uh, and that norm breaks down once one person sends an email saying, this totally isn't urgent, but you know, just in case you're checking email when you're out for the day, that's an example of self-restraint breaking down. Uh, so other examples, you know, unless you're in a unless you're in a context where your work is required to be Section 508 compliant, accessibility is a norm. Uh, it's just good practice. Uh, the same goes for for per performance in the websites that we're talking about today. Uh, the same goes for not launching on a Friday or not working directly on the production server. Uh, many of us have turned these into practical rules, but we're all asked on a regular basis to make exceptions as well. So. I don't bring up norms and self-restraint because I think we're all lazy or that technical debt is just a lack of self-restraint on our part. Uh, I, I think that for those of us here who are enlightened about such things as accessibility and performance and sustainability, uh, we perceive these to be norms. Uh, and unless we convince others to regard these as universal norms, uh, our resistance, our ability to uphold these norms will continue to be eroded uh, and technical debt will creep in. So we're making choices and decisions, uh, as I cited in the definitions, under constraints every day that, that will impact the future. Uh, so another, another relevant example of norms uh, that, that starts to get a little more proactive, um, the web standards movement of the early 2000s drove the shift away from table-based website layouts to separating structure and presentation through markup and style sheets. Uh, there's no law today that says you can't make a website using tables. Uh, but HTML and CSS became the norm. Uh, so I, I think one of the best tactics that, that Jeffrey Zeldman deployed was to make the push to establish such norms about money. Uh, when bandwidth costs money, all that table markup, all those inline font face tags and styles pushed wasteful bits down the pipe and cost real money. 
Uh, demand for web standards was created in large part because a costly financial penalty for waste was quantified. Uh, those are the terms we need to think about when, we're, when it comes to establishing norms around sustainability and performance today. And, and we are talking about those in terms of electric consumption. Um, but we, we need those ways to incentivize stakeholders. Uh, so we have, we have norms that have emerged like web standards. We have perceived norms like under the hood accessibility, performance optimization, things that we might appreciate more than uh, some of our colleagues are aware of. Uh, and, and now we, we're talking about a need to create demand. Uh, for sustainable practices. Uh, we know that it requires self-restraint, uh, resistance, and strength to uphold these norms. Uh, at the same time, we work in a fast-paced industry uh, with a fast-paced evolving medium uh, that in many ways, in many ways the medium that we work in, the internet, uh, it's, it's, it's abstract and it's intangible. Uh, and I think that contributes to, uh, to technical debt emerging as well. So our daily lives uh, now span three worlds. Uh, we have the natural world, we have the built world, and we have our, our digital world that we're talking about today in the context of UX. Uh, most of us spend our days in the built world. We're in offices, we're working from home, we're driving in cars, we're riding mass transportation. Uh, we're growing more aware of the need to appreciate and reconnect with the natural world and to be better stewards of the natural world. Uh, I'd say for many of us, uh, attending a conference focused on sustainability. Uh, we probably, the people here today put a lot of effort into this. Uh, we choose green products, we recycle, we compost, uh, we reduce energy usage and generate less waste. Uh, many of us are in the process of changing our lifestyles and how we occupy the built world to better care for the natural world. But then we open our laptops and we throw unoptimized images online and we build websites with bloated off the shelf platforms or components or we layer in a dozen tracking or advertising scripts and we blame it all on the deadline or the business constraints. Uh, and wherever these practices impact performance or accessibility or, or they keep us from maintaining our core CMS platforms because add-ons are incompatible, uh, these all pile up and create technical debt. Uh, they're not so much a symptom of a lack of knowledge or lack of interest in building resilient or sustainable websites and apps, but of the pace that we are asked to do so. Uh, and so last fall, I, I had tucked this away. I was, I was really disheartened last fall to read a post um, by Christian Heilmann. Uh, th this was talking about embracing JavaScript, in which he said, uh, we live in a world of components. We are continually asked to build something fast that others can reuse in any product. Now he went on to say, uh, it is time to move on and let the new generation of developers deal with the problems of now, instead of us waving a finger and demanding a work ethic that was always a perfect scenario and a small part of how the market worked. And now, whatever the merits um, behind the advocacy for embracing JavaScript in this article, um, and, and Christian is a, a developer evangelist, uh, the sentiments that were expressed, uh, distilling decisions and practices down to profit motive, uh, these ideas were anything but sustainable. Um, and, and you know, while we're talking today about tactics in design and development for more sustainable products that we put out in the world, I think this is our biggest challenge because we can't talk about creating rules and policies to encourage our norms. We can't talk about better production efforts um, if at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to think about conservation of resources and good stewardship when we interact with the natural world, but online we're bombarded with waste and inefficiency and a frenzied pace, uh, not only to get our work done, but also to constantly keep up with the latest and greatest. Uh, we're, we're splitting ourselves in two. And I think we're going to increasingly see uh, the half of ourselves that respects the natural world as more appealing than the half that works in the digital world. And we're going to start to care less about the digital world and about the standards and norms that we do have today, uh, which will degrade as a result. Um, so the question is, uh, how do we create demand uh, then for sustainable and resilient solutions? How do we uh, take this mindset that, that I think many of us here today uh, embrace, uh, and how do we instill that in our colleagues in our stakeholders, in our customers, um, anybody else we encounter in the work we do. Uh, and, and I'd like to talk about that by taking a look at that world in the middle here, uh, the built world. 
the world that is man-made, uh, like our digital world, but much more tangible than our abstract online digital world. And I, it's the tangibility of the built world that I think helps in some ways to keep it in check. Uh, so think about it. If you were building a house uh, and the architect decided halfway through the build to scrap a huge portion of the layout, uh, not only would you end up with wasted time, but you'd have this big tangible heaping pile of physical waste that costs as much as the labor involved. Uh, if you don't build to optimize standard dimensions of lumber when you build a house, you end up with a lot of scrap pieces that aren't good for much more than firewood, but that you did pay for. Uh, in our abstract digital work, the costs of a lack of planning and sustainability to the drivers of our projects are less tangible and costly. But for us here today, they're immense. They're long days, late nights, their frustration, their burnout, their mental health costs, which again, lower our resistance, our strength to uphold our norms, uh, and that's where technical debt starts to creep in. Uh, but, but I do think the built world gives us hope because in the built world, we have, we have today a combination of, uh, of top-down solutions, rules, laws, policies, incentives uh, for building sustainably and efficiently. Uh, as well as bottom-up demand from consumers, from homeowners, uh, from people that in our digital world we'd call users, uh, for more efficient, durable structures. Uh, so this picture uh, and the, the second picture following, um, these are pictures of something called Noble Home. Noble Home is a home building kit designed and produced by my friend Noah Brunberg. Uh, in creating Noble Home, Noah really aspired to design a home that was not only efficient and sustainable using passive energy, uh, things like solar heating, um, but also a home that can be built by a homeowner uh, that demonstrates integrity and is true to the materials it's created from. Uh, all things that are, that are great standards in the built world. Uh, because Noble Home is prefabricated in Noah's shop, there's little waste. Uh, waste would affect his bottom line, um, but also the kit that's shipped to the homeowner contains just the necessary parts to assemble the house, so there's no waste for the homeowner either. Um, so Noah's customers are looking for an efficient, performant, affordable, sustainable home. Uh, there's organic demand there that's now emerged through uh, education, through growing interest in sustainability. That demand is helping transition uh, relationships between the built and natural world through solutions like Noble Home. And so we have that bottom-up demand from consumers and homeowners for high-performance homes, uh, and then we couple that with top-down demand through, uh, through our states and municipal building codes. Um, and we have, we have standards when it comes to home construction. We have things like Passive House. Uh, and I, I think we should be looking as an industry at uh, how we can create similar demand, uh, similar incentives, uh, and similar programs in our industry to, uh, to encourage sustainability. Um, so I, I asked Noah uh, what some of the standards look like that he encounters um, with Noble Home that are applied to the built world. And, uh, and he gave me a list. Um, that I'm going to run through quickly, but I, I think these translate into um, into real uh, real concepts that can be embraced and encouraged and incentivized, uh, which is important. So Noah said, um, the International Energy Conservation Code mandates energy conservation and efficiency standards for both commercial and residential new construction and major renovations. Uh, it's revised to be more aggressive every three years, and states can choose to adopt whichever revision works for them. Uh, we have HERS ratings. Uh, house energy rating systems developed by ResNet, which is an independent nonprofit. Uh, so this is not a governmental body creating rules. This is uh, an independent nonprofit in the industry. Uh, HERS is becoming the national standard for housing energy efficiency and testing. Uh, the scale starts at zero, which is a net zero home, uh, and goes up to 100, which is a standard new home. The higher the rating, the less efficient. Developed in Europe, we have the passive house standard. Uh, that's been gaining popularity in the U.S. among the most serious uh, conservation-minded conservation architects, builders, and homeowners. Uh, professionals are trained in the details required to create homes that require little to no energy uh, input to heat or cool the interior. These can cost 10 to 50 percent more than traditional construction. Uh, most states have adopted the uh, International Energy Conservation Code. Massachusetts has a stretch code which is more stringent than the IECC, uh, and individual towns within Massachusetts can vote to adopt this. About half the towns in Massachusetts have done so to date. Uh, for the stretch code, a preliminary HERS rating based on construction drawings is required to obtain a building permit. A final rating must be verified at the end of the project and must meet the target rating, which is currently HERS 70. In 2017, this will be increased to HERS 55. Uh, HERS ratings are verified by trained professionals who inspect construction and perform 
uh, a blower door test to determine air tightness. So, um, you know, think about uh, having uh, folks in our industry who can conduct audits and tests and have a standard by which they can certify a website. Uh, Connecticut Residential New Construction, uh, they offer rebates up to $4,500 for high-performance construction verified with HERS ratings. Massachusetts has Mass Save, which also offers $4,500 rebates for HERS ratings. Uh, so there we have financial incentives, motivations for stakeholders to embrace uh, high-performance sustainable solutions. Uh, and Noah noted that increases in these mandates do tend to reduce the amount of new housing that is created uh, due to increased costs, which can be 5 to 20% more than typical construction. However, in the more liberal states, they are welcomed in order to reduce total carbon footprints in the state. Um, so I, I interpret that as uh, they slow things down a bit. Um, you know, when, it, when we're talking about the space in which we do our work and it being fast paced, uh, these uh, programs help slow down uh, the decision-making process and, uh, and and how quickly things are are built and churned out into the world. Uh, but again, I'm not I'm not advocating for um, necessarily strict regulation in how we design and build websites and apps. Um, but for the idea that it would be great to have some of these standards spelled out for our industry, recognized, uh, utilized as guidelines for design and development, uh, and going back to Zeldman's approach in the web standards movement, incentivizing stakeholders. Uh, to embrace these standards. Um, so I, I think it's worth asking, um, you know, where can these standards help mitigate costly technical debt? Uh, where can they provide us the framework uh, for decision making, uh, the space for better decisions and choices and long-term strategies? Uh, where can we work better at defining guidelines for accessible, performant, uh, and maintainable websites? And so I come at this talk having spent a lot of my personal time, uh, my non-work time reading, uh, reading about home building, uh, reading about sustainability, reading about climate change, and not just what's being done in the built world, um, but also uh, reconnecting more with the natural world. Uh, and, and the great thing is there is a, a lot happening there that's moving in, in a positive direction. Um, but the more I read and learn about such things in that context, the more troubled I become by our ever-growing uh, digital world and how it changes us. Um, and so for those of us here today as designers and builders of that digital world, I, I think uh, it, it is up to us to, to think about that and to start putting these, uh, these frameworks and guidelines and, and new norms uh, into place. Um, and so, so wrapping up, uh, I, I have two quotes here from a book called Design Like You Give a Damn, uh, which is uh, sort of a catalog of projects and solutions for, um, for, for residential structures, for people in need and uh, following disasters and things like that. Uh, the first is some architects began to see themselves not just as professionals bound to meet the needs of their clients, uh, but as stewards of the built environment and advocates for more sustainable development. Uh, the professional challenge, uh, whether one is an architect in the rural American South or elsewhere in the world, is how to avoid being so stunned by the power of modern technology and economic affluence uh, that one does not lose sight of the fact that people and place matter. Uh, so similarly, uh, let us not lose sight of who we're designing for, uh, the tasks to be done, how our work impacts the natural built and digital worlds. Uh, let us not be so enamored of the latest and greatest that we dismiss sustainable work ethic as impractical. Uh, let us help our colleagues, clients, and customers understand that how we work impacts the work we ship, uh, with technical debt being one consequence, uh, that there are resources to conserve in digital design and development, and that sustainability in the digital world is as important uh, as, is, as it is in the built and natural worlds. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Mark, for that talk. And um, again, I want to encourage anybody who's listening live, if you're not in Slack, take the conversation to Slack. Um, I think there's a lot of wonderful stuff to think about and continue talking about.